through dense fog and freezing rain. The Coast Guard struggles to revive a man desperately clinging to life. Within about a minute of us being on scene, he crashed right in front of us. It was like walking into a trauma bay. When a sailor goes missing, a helicopter crew combs the seas to find him. The person was missing for about two hours before we got the call, so we knew that we had to move a little quicker. And in 10-foot seas, a sinking ship relies on the Coast Guard to stay afloat. I'm probably about five to 10 feet above the boat. And just as I'm hovering over, the trail line breaks. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, the highly trained men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. We've just received word that there is a 63-year-old male in a small town north of us called Pelican who's experiencing uh, cardiac arrest. So as soon as I heard, I started looking at weather. It's pretty crummy right now. Pretty thick fog all the way down to the water. So it didn't take long for us to be flying in instrument conditions with basically zero visibility. Now we're really in a goo. I can't yeah, let's, through the water. Let's, uh, let's pull it back to 90 knots. Yeah, I got just patches here and there going by. But I've got to go visible. Pretty thick pea soup right now. All right, I barely have the water. We hit some pretty significant weather. The ceilings were low anywhere from all the way to the water level to 200, 300 foot. So with that low of visibility, we would have to get down to 200 feet, cruise along, pull back to 80, 90 knots. It was a little more severe than what we in initially thought. You know, we're just plugging away this all day. Yep. So Rob, uh, I know you said we're going to take a light pack. Is that it, the O2 bottle? I was going to take the kit, the O2 bottle, and the whole light pack. That way we can go and set everything up we need to get set up position of it in the litter, and that way when we transfer into the cabin, all we have to do is secure, go. We'll just take it as it comes, okay? Sounds like a plan. I would say that typically I try and scoop the patient up pretty quickly, but for this one, if it's cool with you, I'd like to pre-package them as best we can so we can get a good idea of what's going on. I think we should start pre-staging now if you want to grab the kit. We had been told that the patient was shocked three times prior to even being launched on the case. When you hear that a patient is already being treated with CPR, all any of us were thinking about was the next step. What's the next step? How do we get the patient to the helicopter and help in saving this patient's life? So I can't tell if that's a cloud, but that's just, uh, it does look like a cloud back there, but uh, you can see underneath it. That uh, really clears up out there at about 2 o'clock. Yeah, I'm seeing mountaintops now. Fortunately, Pelican's weather was better than we had en route. So the visibility was good, the ceilings were up fairly high, so we didn't have to slug our way into the pad at Pelican. All right, I can see Pelican, so that's always a good sign. Cabin door's coming open. Roger. Cabin door's open. That's freaking beautiful back here. Yes, it is. See their ambulance. Yep. Shot the approach to the ferry terminal there, which is a little hairy. It's a tight spot that you have to squeeze in. You have to do a pedal turn so you can land in that confined area there. We got lots of We got lots of off the nose here too. And hold. And at that point, I disembarked the swimmer in the HS, and they go to the clinic to go check on the patient. Patient had a heart attack this morning, like right there. We've been doing pretty much CPR on him nonstop for a couple hours now. Stopped breathing, stopped heart rate, everything. And, and then we used a defibrillator to get him back again. That's happened like three times now, so pretty intense. But uh, hopefully, hopefully he's stable now and we can get him. 
get him into somewhere with some better, you know, care. That's that over here. So, so uh, have you been one of the guys working on him? Yeah. Okay, so we heard 63 year old male. Yeah. You guys found him unconscious and then yeah, brought him like, back? Yeah, pretty much. Do you have a, a drip set already? Yeah, set? I think they've already got all that for you. Man, you guys are awesome. Okay, so. Ready to pull this out? Yeah. So, when we walked into the clinic and we're getting a verbal pass down of what was going on with the patient, they had had him stabilized, but they were working on him and uh, they were giving him ventilations. Hi, my name's Rob. I'm my partner, Mike. I'm That's me. All right, Wilbur. Hi, Wilbur. Coast Guard's here. watching you to make sure he's breathing. There. You quit. You quit breathing again. You got a bag? Yeah, I'll turn your machine on. It's on. We need to get the leads on there. Not now. Come on, Wilbur. All right, can you, can you get hands off so I can analyze? Okay. All clear. Shock. That's on. All right, ready? Clear. Shocking. Within about a minute of us being on scene, he crashed right in front of us. All right. All right, go ahead. Start CPR. Come on, Wilbur. We had to roll right into CPR. It was like walking into a trauma bay. There were people providing care, and we just kind of hopped in and tried to take over at that point and, and use the assets that were on scene to help us package the patient and get him in the helicopter as fast as we could. Hey, he's breathing. Hey, he's breathing out of there, Rob. You can stop. Okay. Turn it spontaneous. All righty. All right. Uh, this is, oh, uh, yeah, we got to hurry up and transport him. Let's just package him up. Yeah. OK, grab all the way up. Rob. Ready? Oh, that's 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 right there. there. There's a board on me. We shocked him and he got a rhythm that was able to stabilize his heartbeat and that allowed us to package the patient and move him to the helicopter before he crashed again. So what we need to do is get these straps across, I'll work on that, and then we'll probably need some strong backs to get him into the helicopter. I'm sure you guys are all strong, so if you're cool with helping out, yeah. we'll use the help. So that was, that was his fourth shot? No. That was like his fifth. Yeah, no, you're getting that's like his hand. Hand shock? Yeah. So we'll go up on the side to do what we can. If we can get Mike, we can grab the side over there. One, I two, can. three. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. Awesome. Good job, everybody. Lieutenant Snyder and I were waiting with the helicopter while the rescue swimmer and the corpsman went to package the patient, make sure he's stable enough for the transport. When they came back after only 10 minutes or so, we knew that that was either a good sign because the patient was extremely stable and was an easy package in return, or that something might be up. When I could see Rob, I could put my eyes on him and I noticed he was sweating profusely and I'm thinking, something's out of the norm here. This is, this is not right. He's bagging the whole time and that's when Rob told the captain, sir, we cannot get this man to a hospital fast enough. Let's go! Once we got the patient into the helicopter cabin, in about 30 seconds, he crashed and needed to be given CPR again. All right, everyone clear. Clear, start delivery now. On uh, Delivery now. Delivery now. Delivery now. Delivery It's very complicated to be jammed into that small space and to be moving from chest compressions to ventilations back to chest compressions. It was very chaotic. He did have a heart attack, and they found him unconscious this morning and not breathing. So we knew that he was in rough shape, and he needed to get back to Sitka as soon as possible. It was pretty tense back there. They were really busy trying to keep this guy alive. All right, I think he's back. Good. I think he's back, Rob. Do you have a heart rhythm? He's got a heart rhythm. We had done a couple cycles of CPR. Yeah, he's not breathing right now. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Everyone, clear, clear. And it was taxing on the crew, and we had our flight mechanic, Ryan, and uh, he saw what we were doing, and he hopped right in. Tell you what, Ryan, if you want to swap out after you hit 30, we can do that. I'm comfortable going. I'll go till uh, till his elbow's locked, homie. In the moment of a situation like that, with the severity of life or death, it becomes an instinct, and it, nothing more really than a knee-jerk reaction. You just jump in. You work together. It's a team. Like that situation, it was a 35-minute flight. But it seemed like it was taking forever. Rob, are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, Brian, are you good? 
Good to go, brother. How's he looking? He's, he's hanging in there. Uh, Mr. Snyder, if you need somebody with ACOS there in the ambulance, ready to just start pushing meds and stuff once we get there. Roger. So along the flight, we're regaining his vitals, and we're losing him. I think we lost him a total of three times in flight. Stay clear, stay clear. All right, stock and fight, stock and fight. Clear. You regain, and then you lose, and then you regain, and then you lose. It's just a roller coaster of ups and downs. You're thinking, all right, we've got him. Now we can kind of sit back and just monitor. As soon as we rounded Cape Edgecombe, that's when Mike's like, hey, clear, 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 clear. And we had lost him again. When we got to Cape Edgecombe, we knew that we were almost there, but the patient continually was, uh, they were just working hard on him. I've never seen uh, a crew work together that hard on a patient. I've uh, been doing this really since 1995, but I have never had somebody where it was that close to dying and coming back that many times. So that's kind of playing in your mind going, this is not your normal medevac case. For short finals, I think right now we'll be in there in a second. The cap knew upon our approach that we were in a pretty severe state in the cabin. He knew a bit of hastefulness was required in his landing, and as fast as he could nose over and get us there, we were headed that way. And it was just as smooth as I've ever felt, just like a normal training flight. As we came in, you know, basically had the pedal to the metal, we were uh, going as quickly as we could. The ambulance was waiting, fortunately. The medical folks here did a great job of, of being there, ready to go. And so as soon as we landed, we cleared him out, and they were able to get him in the ambulance with a minimal delay. The ambulance crew in Sitka, they were rock stars. They were another link in the chain of this patient's survival. All righty, they're moving. Well, that's a good sign. Now, that was pretty, pretty intense. It wasn't until a week later that I found out that he actually had survived. When I heard that this gentleman not only had survived, but he was thriving, he was up, he was talking, I, first of all, I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely shocked. And as much as anything else, it makes me once again proud of my crew. The guys in the back, I just can't say enough good things about them. They refuse to let this man go. It's amazing, and it really makes me humble that I'm able to be a part of this team. He'd be alive. Just trying to recover for the most part. And then uh, we'll take it from there. Depends on how well I bounce back. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, it is. I, I think somebody ordered it for me. <laughs> We've been with him in the hospital the whole time he was here, me and my sisters. And his developing coming back from the situation he was in when he came in is a miracle. He's got nine lives and he's using them. <laughs> I want to hug. Okay, you get I love her. you, honey. Uh, if you can't, thanks for You're welcome. They said if he makes it through the night, it would, it's going to be a miracle. And we sat with him, and six in the morning, we were three of us sitting there going, wow, he's still here. I mean, it took a few days. He started opening his eyes, and it's a miracle. I love it. <laughs> I'm happy to be going back home. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a beautiful day for it, too. Uh, yeah, I've spent enough time in the hospital. <laughs> it's time to go. Be with my family. Yes, you should. I gotta thank everybody, Coast Guard, and all the people who worked on me. Search Hospital did a tremendous job. Everyone is doing a wonderful job, treating me like a king. I'm more than happy to be home. Most happy to be home. Here. Yeah, my limo has <laughs> arrived. <laughs> the family's really been looking forward to him coming home. Been waiting for this day for a while. I would have to 
say thank you to the Coast Guard from the whole community of Pelican here. It's pretty awesome. Hi, Wilmer. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, yes. Oh. It's pretty important to have the services the Coast Guard provides for this community because it's pretty much the only way to get almost instant response, as close as you can possibly get to instant, to get life-saving situations handled. After hearing the story of how long they worked on him, I mean, I have to give kudos and props to every person in the community who helped Wilbur because without them and without the Coast Guard's response, we wouldn't have Wilbur. We shocked this patient five times in transit and the VPSO reported that they had shocked him at least 10 times before we'd gotten on scene. And I've never heard of that in my career. To see somebody have a positive outcome from over two hours of CPR, it's unprecedented. And it's a testament just to how tough Alaskan people are. This guy just wasn't gonna quit. So we weren't gonna quit on him. We got word that there's a vessel taking on water. The sea state was, I believe, eight to 10 feet, somewhere in there, and 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. We got the call that there was a vessel taken on water in the vicinity of the fair weather grounds. As a rescue swimmer, when you hear vessel taken on water, you just want to make sure that you bring all the extra gear that you would need, such as an extra pump and possibly an extra raft. You need your bag, sir, or what? No, I just oh. see him making sure we got We got word that there's a vessel taken on water. I believe it's a 70-footer. And right now, that's about all we know. As we make our way there, we'll get in contact with Sector Juno, who has uh, communications with the boat, and try and get more information, such as how many people, what condition they're in, all that. Air 30, be advised, we are airborne at this time. 05 persons on board, en route for fair weather grounds for SAR. I was wondering, when was the last time you talked to the vessel Masonic, and also if they were able to pass along uh, weather conditions, sea state, and wind. Over. This is Coast Guard Sector Juno. Be advised the seas are 8 feet and the winds are blowing to the east. The water temperature in Sitka around this time of year is around 40 degrees, maybe 39. Out there in the fair weather grounds, it's going to be even less. So there's definitely a sense of urgency when you hear that there's a boat taken on water. So guys, we're uh, going to be dropping this guy up top, I guess, and we'll see what happens. So depending on the rigging, I'm kind of thinking that with the pump, it might be best just to drop the cam down. And then uh, as I'm guiding on, I'll be able to start it up for him. Roger that, sir. When we talked to Sector Juno, we got word that Sea State uh, was, I believe, 8 to 10 feet, somewhere in there, and 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. So yeah, we're thinking about whether we're going to put down a swimmer and do a trail line delivery of the pump. Coast Guard Hilo, Masonic, go ahead. We're going to be there probably uh, oh, five to eight minutes or so, and looking to see what kind of extra rigging you have. Is it just your mast, or do you have any other rigging uh, uh, out? Uh, no, it's just the mast. Really, the only safe place to do the drop would be on the bow of the boat. OK, copy that. We'll take a look at it once we get on the scene. Some of the things we're looking at is obstacles on the vessel, see if they can take down any antennas, obstructions, and just making sure that we've got a safe uh, as platform as possible. Uh, uh, door speed, sir. Yeah, just yeah, door speed. Speed. Roger, door's coming open. Uh, up sonic from the uh, Coast Guard helicopter. Just looking at the uh, aft portion of your vessel uh, on top of the cabin area there. What I'm going to do is drop a, a trail line down and then have you guys guide our rescue stripper down to the bow, and then we'll do the uh, pump the same way. I copy. Yeah, all right, that sounds good. Um, I'll inform them that we're going to do this on the bow, and I'll keep my current heading right now. Yeah, so we were able to raise the captain, and uh, basically what we want 
to make sure that he knows what to look for when we get on scene. We want to make sure that we're on the same page, that uh, what he's expecting us to do is what we're doing. And we just want to make sure that um, if there's any obstacles out there that they can remove anything that's, uh, you know, along the deck edge, stuff that's going to be blown around or be uh, become a hindrance or a safety concern. We want to make sure all that stuff is cleaned up before we get there. All right, you got any questions? No, sir. Please, please. Roger, rest of checklist complete, ready for one trail line delivery to the vessel right away. Safety is paramount. You know, everything we do, it's all about keeping our guys safe and the safety of the people on the vessel. There's nothing we're looking at more than can we put our swimmer down safely and safely get them onto the boat? Because if we can't, then we just have more problems. Swimmer's ready. Good away. Roger, swimmer's going outside the cabin door for load check. Boat check complete, swimmer's going down. Swimmer's going down. Hold. Probably about five to 10 feet above the boat. And the crew members are pulling in the trail line, which in essence, they're pulling me onto the bow of the boat. And just as I'm hovering over the bow of the boat, the trail line breaks. Storm's ready. Good hoist. Roger. Storm's going outside the cabin door for load check. Load check complete. Storm's going down. So we are launched on a case fishing vessel, a Masonic, taking on water. The sea state on scene is probably about 10 foot or more seas, and this is an old schooner vessel, so it's bobbing around pretty good. There's probably around 35 knot winds with the gust. It's not the, the most ideal hoisting conditions. Turn's going down, hold. Just because of the sea state and the winds, the boat did a couple rolls that were, were kind of unanticipated, and one of them, the mast came kind of towards us. And in the process of that, the trail line actually parted. Cam happened to be grabbing onto a guy water, and they, they let him right down on the boat. The is on deck. Star is disconnected. And retrieving bear hook. And bear hook is clear of the vessel, clear back and left. All right, how'd that go? It was all right, sir. Did rock and roll pretty good. Yes, sir. Once I was on the boat, I wanted the two pumps. I changed locations. Uh, more like a midships right in the middle of the boat instead of the bow. And then I just gave him a thumbs up, letting him know that I was ready for delivery of the pump. And the pump's going out the cabin door. Pump is outside the cabin door and going down. Pump's going down. Easy forward and right. That was definitely one of the more challenging hoists I've done. The pump just landed on deck, and we moved it towards the back of the boat just to get it out of the way. It's still a stressful atmosphere, but I think everyone overall feels better. They started up on the first pull, which is always a good sign. Everything I've done is done now on the boat, and it's time for me to get back to the helicopter. Yeah, just uh, before we uh, get out of here and depart, just want to make sure we got a, uh, your intentions so we can pass those back to Sucker. Uh, we'll run into uh, Cross Sound, get a hold of the owner of the boat, and uh, probably get a part sent into uh, Puna there. Okay, I understand that. Well, uh, we're going to be doing our approach down, getting our uh, rescue swimmer. Since there's so much rigging and everything, we decided and Cam agreed that it would be easier and safer for uh, Cam to just jump off the boat on his own and swim a little way clear of the vessel, and then we would pick him up with bear hook recovery. All right, ready for him to jump in? Looking like he's going to jump off the back. Right. There's Cam on the uh, port side, looks like. Port side, yes, sir. All right, your boy's ready to go swimming. All right, here yeah. we go. Yeah, it's not feeling too bad, sir. This will be uh, manageable here. All right, he's in the water. I got, like him. I got him in sight. Roger. Easy right. And bear hook in the water. Char is at the hook, waiting for the ready for pickup. I have ready for pickup. Prepare to take the load. Taking the load. Storm is clear of the water. You're clear to move as required. Swimmer is coming up. Thanks a lot, guys. Good job. Swimmer is just below the cabin door. Swimmer is at 
the cabin door. Yeah, bring it from her inside the cabin. You know, unfortunately, the best outcome doesn't always happen. There are uh, loss of life, uh, loss of property. In this case, though, just the way everybody worked together, that didn't happen. Uh, it was successful. The boat got in safely. Everybody on board was safe. The crew, uh, we came back safely. So, and as far as uh, being in the Coast Guard and, and doing what we do, that's uh, that's the outcome we live for. Cam, you up? I'm uh, just digging deep in a uh, kick cat right now. Awesome. Well, I didn't take your head off at the pump, so I'm happy. How'd it look from down there? Look at that pump differently when it's swinging at you, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, oh, those guys on deck were real helpful. Yeah, it seems like they knew what the hell they were doing. I just swam, like, as fast as I could away from the boat, though. Oh, dude, you were plowing through the water. What'd I do? <laughs> My name is Zach Ryan. I've been fishing out of Alaska, Southeast Alaska for about, oh, about 10 years. And we are longliners. Well, we were in the Fairweather grounds. We had just laid our gear and it came to the attention of one of the crew members that there was much too much water down there. And thus we had to start pumping it out. We kept on taking on water and didn't know where it came from. So that's when the call came in to the Coast Guard. When we heard that the Coast Guard chopper was coming, we knew that everything was okay. It was kind of exciting, really, because I haven't seen a, a Coast Guard helicopter out like that close to the boat. It's completely imperative to have the help of the Coast Guard. And just knowing that you have somebody there to scoop you up or to bring you something is such a stress reliever. I don't know how many lives have been saved. I hope I see those guys back at Sitka so I can say thanks properly. I would love to buy you a beer at the pub. And I want to say thanks to the Coast Guard helicopter, the pilot, the guy that flew down onto the boat and hit the bow. They all acted very professional and did a good job, and I'm glad they were there to help. This is my wife, Mindy. Mrs. Oh, Mindy? This is Chris Palau. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay. Off that, Susie. Okay, yeah. you have. She's over there, girl. My name is Ward Salen. I'm a commander at the U.S. Coast Guard, and I'm the commanding officer at Coast Guard Air Station Sitka. Today, we've got several uh, families from the air station, uh, some of the pilots have brought their families out. And today, we're out uh, just enjoying the day, and we're here at the Sitka Raptor Center, uh, kind of learning about raptors. So this is Sitka, and Sitka is a female bald eagle. She came to us back in 2002. You guys have questions about her? How old was she when she came to you? Ah, good question. She was about two years old when she came to us uh, for treatment. The main flight training center is a state-of-the-art facility. Uh, it's designed as basically our third step of rehabilitation. When a bird arrives here at the Raptor Center, we'll bring them into the clinic and we'll treat them and develop a plan based on their injuries. And um, when they're healthy enough to fly, we'll move them into the main flight training center uh, where we can observe them just in a natural environment without stress um, until they're ready to go back out in the wild. How old is she now? She is 12 years old this year, so she's been with us 10 years. So. Hello, I'm CJ. Well, we're learning a lot about the flight of the birds. It's a snow owl. You mostly see snow owls on runways. You know why? They like flat surfaces, and those flat surfaces help them walk. I'm Mindy Sandlin. I'm married to Ward, who's the CEO here at Sitka. One thing that was really neat for us today was getting a chance to see the eagles up close, and the other raptors as well. This has been a nice chance to just get a little more hands-on, closer look at them, um, find out a little more you know, information about them. What's the rules about uh, eagle feathers? It's a felony um, to possess them still. A felony, a felony yeah. Um, because they can't prove that you didn't kill the eagle to get its feathers or to get its parts. 
Um, so yeah, they're still protected even though they're no longer endangered. Usually when you see eagles in the lower 48, they're you know, in a zoo or some, something like that and you don't really get a chance to, to really learn about them. Alaska has so many eagles and the opportunity to, to get close to them to learn about them to a plate, uh, in a place where they have a lot of them. So definitely a, a unique Alaskan experience for us and the family. Sector Juno 30, be advised we are now on scene and we are going to be starting our search. The person was missing for about two hours before we got the call. Took a skiff and went to shore with his dog and he never ended up coming back. I'm James Gibson, I'm a lieutenant here at Air Station Sitka. Right now we've got a fishing vessel Windsong called in. One of their crew members went ashore with their dog in a 16-foot skiff uh, south of here on Warren Island. The captain of the vessel can no longer contact his crew member and can't see him on the shore, so we're getting ready to launch to go take a look, see if we can find him and make sure he's okay. All right, got this little island on the left-hand side. I'm going to slowly come left and uh, kind of cut the inside of our track here. We'll clear our radar. Is the fog a little worse out here? Uh, on the left side, the fog's bad. Right side, the fog's good. No fog, I should say. What did you say the name of the boat was? It's a 16-foot skiff from the fishing vessel Windsong. My name's Cameron Cullen. I'm here at Air Station Sitka. I'm a rescue swimmer. In this particular situation, the missing person, John, took a skiff and went to shore with his dog just to get out and stretch his legs or go to the bathroom or whatever he needed to do. And he never ended up coming back. The person was missing for about two hours before we got the call. And we got the call around midnight. We had very good weather, a little bit limited visibility at times in route. But overall, I think we had uh, decent weather. Also be advised that the reporting source has told us that they have heard screaming from all land. However, they have not located the 16-foot aluminum skiff. Just be on the lookout for it, over. Well, anytime we hear a missing person, I know that I'm going to be using the EOIR, which is just a type of infrared camera that we have in the back of the helicopter. We're approaching Warren Island, and then I'm just really focusing all my attention. And the pilots in front are also trying to contact the captain on the fishing vessel so we can locate them. Fishing vessel, wind stop. This is Coast Guard, 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 so he wasn't able to get back. Yeah. I'm hoping that's what it is. Sector Juno 30, be advised we are now on scene and we're going to be starting our search. Rescue 30, Sector Juno, Roger, and Constantia on scene. All right, sir, I'm coming forward. Yep, got it. Five, 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 you're you're good. Three, you're good. You're good. Of course. And then, Cam, if you can get the IR up so we can get any kind of heat signatures. Yes, sir, it's up right now. AET2, Christopher Castro, Station Air Station Sitka. My job as a flight mechanic is to search out the window. So I got to rely on the track of him, as we call it, to give me my frame of reference. There he is. Got him right there, yep. Yep. He was right at 3 o'clock. That's uh, 3 to 4 o'clock right now. And crew brief, uh, we're going to be landing right on that beach there, Chris. Uh, you got door speed at this time. Right on. Cam, if you could just give the sector heads up that we got the person in sight, we're going to be uh, conducting a beach landing. Commodore. Saw the member pretty much immediately. We had a lot of sandy beach that we could put the helo on. We pretty much saw a spot right off the bat and went for it. Shells over the beach, you're clear down. That's a good spot. Our flight met Chris Castro, conned us down to the beach, and then once we were safe on deck, Cam Cullen, our uh, swimmer, went out to talk to the crew member on shore, make sure he's all right, and see what the situation was. Right when I walk up to John, I see that all his clothes are dry but he didn't really have any survival equipment or anything like that with him. I also noticed he didn't have any shoes on, and also that his boat was high and dry, and there was tons of sand and water in it, and the engine wasn't on the back, and the fuel tank was gone, so 
My initial thought was, OK, he's safe. We're just missing his dog. We knew that from the loud noise of the helicopter and the rotor wash and everything, he probably just ran off into the woods. What's your dog's name? Mickey. Mickey? The whole crew started walking up and down the beach looking for the dog. But at this point, there was just no sign of him. But we knew that the uh, survivor would come back the next day and try to find him. After Cam had evaluated the survivor, he felt that the best plan of action would be to try to get his skiff back in the water and get the man to his boat. Saving lives is the number one thing that we're here to do. Saving property isn't really our job. However, in this situation, there was a beautiful day outside, so I figured, OK, you know, let's try to help this guy out as much as we can. Cam decided that we're going to wade the boat out with him past the first break in the surf. So we got the uh, fuel line attached, then we're dragging it and kind of inching our way to the beach. He put it in gear and he started going, and I thought everything was good. And then the fuel line ended up disconnecting uh, to the motor, and then he was uh, dead in the water right there in the breakers. We all got together and started pulling the boat onto shore. I can tell at this point that the survivor, John, is just a little more mentally and physically fatigued just from being stranded on that beach for the last you know, couple hours. So we knew that we had to move a little quicker, get this boat up onto shore, and tie it off safely so we can get him home. Name's John, live in Craig, Alaska, working on the boat. And uh, we were headed back up from Ketchikan, taking the boat back up, and stopped off in the Warren Cove. Just the wrong timing with the tides and the breakers coming in to get back out. Got swamped. You hang in there, John? All right. Next stop, you're going home. The skipper didn't know what was happening. It was dark out. I was unable to communicate with him. So he ended up calling the Coast Guard, and they came and rescued me. And at that time, Mickey decided to take off because he didn't like the helicopter. We had to leave him, come back to Craig. The skipper brought the boat back to Craig. Next morning, we went back out to the cove, retrieved the skiff and Mickey. Guys, ready to back? Ready, yeah. I was very impressed. I think the Coast Guard did go above and beyond to help me. They were concerned not just about me, about my dog also, try to help me get the skiff back off. They didn't just grab me by the scruff of the neck and say, oh, we're gone. It took a lot of time out of their day just to help me out, made me feel very comfortable and safe. And I'd like to thank Jim and Cam and Chris the, uh, from the Coast Guard. They all went, like I think, they went out of their way, you know, to help me, and I really appreciated it. Good boy. Good boy. Come here. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the commanding officer, I would like to welcome you to the retirement ceremony for aviation survival technician, first class, Noel Hutton. Station, attention. My name is Noel Hutton, and my rank is aviation survival technician, first class. Today is my retirement, 22 and a half years of the Coast Guard. Present the colors. Colors, forward, march. And salute. This was my first air station as a rescue swimmer and Noel's last station. So I got to learn a lot uh, under his mentorship. Mark time. He's done a lot for the United States Coast Guard. And to be able to watch him on his last day and be here to celebrate with him is, is a pleasure. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank our guest here today, uh, Noel's guest, for coming and, uh, and joining us as we uh, spend just a few minutes today celebrating uh, Noel's career and his accomplishments. Noel is a mainstay here at the air station. He's a true professional, but for those of you who know him, you know he's a quiet professional. Noel doesn't talk much about his accomplishments and what he does, but if you have any doubt, he's a hero. Noel is a man who has willingly, for his entire adult professional career, been willing to step into the door 
and jump into the ocean and risk his life so that others may live. That takes a special person. In a group of outstanding people, Noel is a standout. God, I'm gonna miss the flying here. The Alaska helicopter flying. There's nothing like it in the world. Not only flying in the best country, but I'm also flying with the best crew and the best pilots in the world. But the thing that drove me most to the Coast Guard was we're there to help others. We we're always there to help others. But especially when I thank my wife, Lisa, it was about her and my family. That's why I do this. To my mom. Hold on. My mom was a single mom. <clears throat> she dedicated her life to me and my brother. Whatever she did was for us. She's the strongest woman I know. She took me to swim practices. She got me involved in swimming. And I think looking back, if you know it wasn't for her sparking my interest in those things, I would have never had this job. I didn't know I was gonna be in his speech. And uh, that was a very tearful moment. I'm just exploding with admiration for him, happiness. A mom couldn't be more proud than I am of a son that's been in the Coast Guard for 22 years. That's number one. For 22 years, this sailor has stood the watch. While some of us were in our bunks at night, this shipmate stood the watch. In those years when the storm clouds of SAR were seen brewing on the horizon, this shipmate stood the watch. Many times he would cast an eye ashore and see his family needing that hand to hold during those hard times, but he still stood the watch. He stood to watch so that we, our families, and our fellow countrymen could sleep soundly in safety. Today, we are here to say, shipmate, the watch stands relieved. Relieved by those you have trained, guided, and led. Shipmate, you stand relieved. We have the watch. <laughs>